Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Brittany Van Dyke, and I am a customer success manager at 1920 Diagnostics. And I come to you with a background in global health and in healthcare quality. A warm welcome to the third episode of the How to Fight Superbugs, the Power of DNA Analysis webinar series presented to you by 1920 Diagnostics. Today, I am very happy to talk to you through some case studies uh, of DNA typing and phylogenetic trees being used for impact infection control. Before I do that, I just want to say that the How to Fight Superbugs series is meant for you, a frontline infection fighter interested in adding genomics to the existing infection control repertoire of tools and procedures. We aim to demystify the bioinformatics behind impact infection control in this series so that it can be made more accessible to more healthcare professionals be on the lab. And before I move on, I want to remind you that this webinar is being recorded, but the intention is to capture my voice and my screen. So the chat and your video will not be shared. Um, if you do happen to turn on your audio to ask a question um, or by accident, it will be captured, but we can always remove that later if that's what you would like us to do. So here is today's agenda. Uh, I'll start off with talking about some typing methods. I went over uh, a few in the first webinar, but I will recap just two today. Uh, head into anatomy of a tree, what phylogenetics, tree, phylogenetic trees look like. Um, and then I'll take us through three different case studies, one with Shigella, uh, one MRSA, and one BRE. Wrap it up with a summary and then have some Q&A and discussion. So feel free to add questions in the chat uh, as we go along. I will get started by doing a bit of a review from my first webinar, as I mentioned. Uh, it was called the New Gold Standard of Pathogen Typing, and it is available on the 1928 Diagnostics YouTube channel for those who may have missed it, um, or if you'd like to watch it again. I want to go quickly over those two of the gold standard typing methods, CGMLST and SNP. For CGMLST, or Core Genome Multilocus Sequence Typing, we take advantage of whole genome sequencing to identify the core genes in every sample or isolate. This is because the core genes are present in every strain of a pathogen, which increases your ability to trust what you're seeing and not experience any noise from accessory genes or plasmids. CGMLST specifically counts the number of different genes or alleles between samples so that when you organize it into a phylogenetic tree, you can clearly see how genetically related two or more samples are. What's more is that because you know you are directly comparing the same genes in every sample, it provides a very reliable and reproducible comparison. It's a robust method that can be used to quickly rule an isolate in or out of an outbreak cluster, potentially saving a lot of infection control resources, aka time, money, and brain power. Next up, we have SNP, or Single Nucleotide Polymorphism Analysis. There's a hint in the name for what makes SNP analysis different than CGMST, and that is nucleotide. Instead of comparing the genes or alleles between samples, SNP compares every single nucleotide and counts how many differences there are. SNP is the most high resolution typing method, and it's like taking a very big magnifying glass to every single nucleotide. So every ATCG in the genome. The discriminatory power of SNP is undeniably useful, and it can be very helpful in identifying or ruling out outbreaks of species that remain very similar as they replicate and evolve. We call those clonal species, or for species that don't have a CGMST schema available, either online or from your own lab. It can also be helpful when looking at potential outbreaks over short time periods. However, there's a small catch with SNP analysis, and that is that it requires a little bit more experience or expertise to tease out recombination and homologous gene transfer. And also that it requires you to use a highly similar reference genome to align against, um, to line your samples against, which can be tricky to find and may take some trial and error and read that as more time. Therefore, in a clinical workflow, SNP is slightly less practical for the day-to-day -day ruling in and out of outbreaks and is best used for digging deeper into a suspected outbreak or in a research capacity. Generally, we recommend that CGMST be used as the first line of identification and that SNP be used as second line. And that being said, it is ideal to have both easily available to you. 
because it does depend on the species and the situation and what kind of expertise you have available to you. Now I'm going to move on to the phylogenetic tree, but before I do, I want to put up a poll for you because I'm interested to know your level of experience or knowledge working with phylogenetic trees. Um, so just bear with me and I will pull that up. You should see it now. Are you an expert, very experienced, intermediate, beginner? I can answer that. And just pouring in, I've got seven of 12. There we go. All right, so I see we have some experts in the room, or at least one of you call yourself an expert. I'm sure there are more experts there. Uh, you might undersell yourself, but um, I'm really happy to have you all here. Welcome to the experts. Do you feel free to jump in and add any information to what I'm saying in the chat? Um, but also we do have some beginners and you're of course welcome. I'm glad you're here and are interested in learning something new. If you have any questions or comments, please don't hesitate to put them in the chat. Um, my colleague Demetrius, who is a bioinformatician, is available to answer questions that come up in there uh, or maybe the experts in the room could chime in as well. Otherwise, I will get to them later in the webinar. Um, okay, so the phylogenetic tree is simply a data visualization. It is showing us how the DNA of many organisms compare to one another by calculating how many changes in the DNA take place. We can establish an evolutionary history of an organism by doing this, in our case, a bacteria. We use whole genome sequencing to uncover those ATCG combinations, the nucleotides, which make up the genomes of our bacteria. And the genomes are aligned against each other. And then the allelic or gene differences for CGMLST or the nucleotide differences for SNP are counted. There are many different methodologies to count the differences, and I'm definitely oversimplifying that process, but that is on purpose for today's webinar. Um, it is for the sake of simplicity. So there are different methods that you can use to formulate a phylogenetic tree, but in the 1928 platform, we use the UPGA, UPGMA algorithm or unweighted pair group method with arithmetic mean to count and cluster. And clustering is the end step and what is what actually forms the look of the phylogenetic tree. Two keywords to mention here are the node, which is the place uh, where these lines meet. Um, and the branches, which are these horizontal lines. When using the UPG, UPGMA method, the nodes represent the number of differences between samples or clusters, and the branches simply are simply meant to help organize those clusters, uh, so it's more visually uh, easy to understand. However, with different methods, you know, other than UPGMA, and different types of trees, branches could represent other things like genetic distance or even time, while nodes could represent a common ancestor, and it just depends on what you use. Finally, just a quick note that the order of the samples in this image, bacteria A, B, C, and D here do not matter. They can be listed in any order, and it would not change the meaning of the tree or the phylogeny, only the organization and how it looks. So I have this slide here to show you that phylogenetic trees can look quite different with the rooted dendrograms, radial rooted trees, unrooted trees, or minimal spanning trees. And this is based on the method used to formulate the tree. Different methods than UPGMA, such as neighbor joining, maximum parsimony, or Bayesian ref inference, these can be different based on the bioinformatic tools that you use for your analysis. The biggest takeaway here is that the same genomic data can be presented in different ways and still portray the same or similar information. Um, yeah, but note that in these three images on the slide, it is the same genomic data being displayed. It's just a different way of looking at it. And now finally, we get to the fun part, the case studies. 
Um, I'm going to start us off with a case of Shigella in Switzerland, take us through MRSA in the UK, and then VRE in Denmark. I'm having a little fun with the titles here since they kind of rhyme, but unfortunately the last one doesn't rhyme so well. But like I said, the first case study for today is of a sexually transmitted Shigella outbreak identified in Switzerland. However, this study explores three patient cases that were likely contracted outside of Switzerland and overall points towards a more regional European outbreak. Shigella causing shigellosis is a bacteria that largely goes unreported and is not specifically tracked across Europe, as opposed to pathogens like Staph aureus or Euphacium. These cases were of a strain particularly vulnerable to antimicrobial resistance and seem to be common strains, strains that circulate in the men who have sex with men population within Europe. Despite this, the only detailed research into Shigella outbreaks of this kind at the time of publication had been done in the UK. When the researcher in Switzerland sequenced the three Shigella cases and compared them in a SNP-based phylogenetic tree, it became clear that two of three isolates were very closely related, and one of the isolates was more distant. I will zoom into the tree in just a moment, so don't strain your eyes too much right now. But um, to, provide, to provide context to the investigation at hand, the researcher uploaded the sequence data from, from the UK study as a further comparison, adding some more information for his cases. And in addition to displaying the SNP distances in a tree, the antimicrobial resistance profile was also added. And this is what you see in the purple and yellow rectangles in the image. They each represent a resistance gene. And now is a good time to mention that this image is not from the original publication. Rather, it is taken from a 1928 white paper where we have recreated the outbreak investigation in our platform, and we were able to match the phylogeny of the original publication, including the UK cluster. So actually matching two different studies here. In the magnifying glass, you can see the clinical cases one and two, which have extremely few SNP distances between them. Furthermore, they have identical AMR profiles. And if this were to happen in a single location, like on a hospital ward with overlapping timeframes, you might consider this a transmission event or at least look a little deeper into it. But what's interesting here, however, is that the metadata or epidemiological data for these cases rule out a direct transmission as they occurred six months apart and one case was acquired in Paris or Munich while the other was acquired in Berlin. So what this tells us as investigators is that there is an active ongoing outbreak of Shigella in the region and that, of course, there are overlooked or missing cases. And here is the third patient case from Switzerland, which is very dissimilar to the other two cases. But we can see in the phylogenetic tree that it is actually fairly closely related to a cluster first identified in that UK study. It also shares an identical AMR profile to other isolates in that cluster. Not all, but most. Um, especially given the period of time that separates case three and the UK cluster, it again tells us, in, us as mm -hmm. investigators that there is another even longer ongoing outbreak in the region. So the close genetic relatedness of these cases to each other and to the UK cases, along with the fact that there are no direct transmission events identified here, provides justification for more widespread surveillance across Europe. Genomic surveillance becomes even more justifiable when considering what happened in the UK because what actually happened there is that once the cluster was identified and this research was uh, published, a public awareness and health education campaign was initiated, which is most likely what caused a later decline in the Shigella cases in the MSM community uh, in the UK. So the conclusion here is that regional surveillance can actually help target populations for health interventions and decrease the overall disease burden, which is pretty cool. Okay, now for the second case, which is a fairly famous one, as Sharon Peacock has presented it in conferences before. If you're familiar with it, I hope that it's as much a favorite of yours as it is mine. Otherwise, I just hope that I do it justice. 
because this case looks at an active investigation of MRSA identified in a special care baby unit in the UK. The investigation was triggered as they had found three babies colonized with MRSA in the same unit at the same time. To start the investigation, the infection control team pulled all the cases of MRSA on the unit from the previous six months, identifying 11 more cases. But there were gaps in the metadata where the timelines didn't quite overlap and the antimicrobial resistance profiles of the cases were different, including the three current cases. Traditionally, this would end an outbreak investigation in a hospital. It would actually be ruled out. But instead, all isolates were whole genome sequenced and compared in a SNP-based phylogenetic tree. In the visualization taken from the original publication, you see the unrooted tree. In figure B, you see the original 14 cases on the special care baby unit. And in figure D, you see some additional cases, which I will get to in just a second. And from this tree, the infection control team could actually see the close genetic relatedness of the cases and ruled in the outbreak again, despite the mismatch in metadata and the AMR profiles. So then the investigators looked further and sequenced random isolates from their hospital, from other hospitals, and from the community, where they were able to identify another 11 cases with similar genetic relatedness, bringing the total to 25 cases in this outbreak cluster. They were also able to use epidemiological data to find overlaps in time and location to figure out transmission routes that link back to the special care baby unit, which is really the goal of all of this when we get that resolution. However, this still didn't explain that initial gap in metadata from the baby unit itself, why all of those initial 14 cases didn't line up. And so when a 15th baby was identified as part of the same cluster more than 50 days since the previous colonized babies had left the unit, the team went back to sequencing and comparing DNA fingerprints and phylogenetic trees, this time sequencing over 260 hospital staff. In this stage of the investigation, they identified a healthcare worker on the unit who was colonized with MRSA, which fit into this outbreak cluster. The healthcare worker was then decolonized and the outbreak was stopped. So what I think is interesting about this case is how the investigation was done in these stages where they iterated between traditional epidemiological methods and genomic or DNA methods, AKA using phylogenetic trees to target their next steps. Now, I said that what I thought was interesting was the investigation stages, but what is actually very important here is the morbidity or illnesses that occurred due to not identifying an outbreak as quick as what would have been possible had all MRSA cases been sequenced and clustered all along, aka a surveillance program. And that is uh, unfortunate that these numbers here all or at least many of the illnesses, healthcare visits, and treatments could have been avoided with early detection, saving money, time, and poor health experiences of the patients. And before I wrap up this case, I want to show you this phylogenetic tree, which is actually a CGMLST-based tree as opposed to the SNP-based trees used in the original publication. And it was formulated in the 1928 platform. We were actually able to produce the same results in terms of phylogeny with CGMLST than as with the SNP, which would lead to the same decisions in an outbreak investigation. Why I have included this here is because of the clinical significance. I mentioned earlier when talking about CGMLST as a method, that it is robust, reproducible, and fast, and how SNP analysis may require some more expertise for interpretation or when choosing a reference genome. In practice, it is quite easy to add new isolates or cases to a CGMLST-based phylogenetic tree and place them into the right cluster, if any. But with the SNP analysis, because the isolates need to be very genetically related in order to produce a trustworthy phylogenetic tree, you would have to compare the isolate to each cluster before finding the right fit. Um, if there even was a right fit, it might not be involved in any cluster, existing cluster. Um, so this would take more time and effort. 
And this is why in a clinical surveillance program in a hospital, or perhaps in a country or region as well, it would be recommended to formulate a CGMLS tea tree first and then move to a SNP only, uh, only if you are ruling in an outbreak and would need a higher resolution view. If the outbreak is ruled out as CGMLST, then there would be no further action required. Um, now, this study was done in 2012. This is before CGMLST was really used. So I would like to think that if CGMLST was around back when this uh, case happened, that the authors might have considered that analysis over SNP. But um, that's to be confirmed. But all of this brings me to the third case. Uh, here we have a case in Southern Denmark. It is a retrospective study with 64 Ethacium isolates collected over a five year period, all having been whole genome sequenced and included in the investigation. Using a CGMLST based phylogenetic tree, it was very easy to see that three clusters emerged or three separate outbreaks. Each outbreak's isolates were very similar in AMR profile and carried the VAN-A gene for vancomycin resistance. And each cluster also had its own sequence type. So what happened here is that the investigators chose to take the isolates from each identified cluster and formulate a SNP-based phylogenetic tree. So we started with CGMLST and moved to SNP as the second step. This allowed them to look deeper into the clusters, and particularly by bringing in metadata, such as date and location of sample collection, um, they could com compare and take a closer look. And I should note that samples were collected from multiple hospital departments, as well as community over five years. So there's quite a different, or quite a range of samples present here. The idea for this second stage, stage SNP analysis alongside metadata would be to try and identify transmission chains like they did in the UK special care baby unit. However, for this study, it was not possible. And this is because of the larger time period where exits are found, as well as there being little or no overlap in location. So the authors do rightfully note that the location of sample collection does not necessarily suggest the location of transmission. This would um, require a little bit more digging and getting epidemiological information to figure that out. Furthermore, in this study, the authors used an exclusion distance of 10 nucleotides in the SNP-based tree. SNP trees are a little bit vulnerable, and this is why they use this, because they can be confounded by recombination events or homologous gene transfer where many nucleotides in one region of a gene are different and actually should, in interpretation, be considered one SNP event. Otherwise, isolates could look very genetically different even if they are not. And the way to counteract these confounders, or I'll call them noise, is to use an exclusion distance. In this study, the authors chose to use a distance of 10, which means that individual nucleotide changes must be located at least 10 nucleotides apart on the gene. Otherwise, they would be counted as one. And this prevents you from mistakenly ruling out an outbreak or a possible transmission event. So that might have sounded a bit more complicated, but uh, it is a complicated concept. So I'll bring us back. Um, overall, in this study, clustering the individual outbreaks was as far as it got, or at least as far as what was published in terms of interventions. And this is because without even more in-between cases being sequenced and without more robust metadata, transmission chains couldn't be identified, at least not yet, not without some further investigation. But something that is interesting from this case is that the incidence of the, VRC, the VRE strains with their AMR profiles um, are representative of what is seen in all of Denmark, not just the South where this study happened which suggests that national monitoring over time could be effective in helping to identify potential transmission sources and then target invest interventions to eliminate those sources. And of course, this remains to be seen. We are getting close to the end of the webinar now. So here's where I remind you to add any questions or comments in the chat. Um, 
we'll get to them in just a minute. But first, of course, a quick recap of what we covered today. Um, starting with typing methods, including CGMST and SNP, what they are, and some high-level advantages and disadvantages. Uh, what is a phylogenetic tree and what they can look like? as well as case studies, which build a case for regional, national, and local or hospital surveillance. Uh, they also showed what CGMST and SNP trees look like in real world investigations and how they are used to rule in or out outbreaks, identify transmission routes, and target further investigations or interventions. But of course, this is all alongside epidemiological or metadata. They do go hand in hand. And now, of course, it's time for the classic poll of how was your experience today. Uh, I'll launch this just before we get to the questions. And you should see that now. Go ahead and add your answer. Your opinion. <laughs> and it is uh, anonymous, I believe. So don't be afraid to put the not so great in there. <laughs> And so far, I don't see any questions in the chat. If you're doing some private messaging, that's great too. But if you do have any questions, comments, or even ideas for new webinar topics, now is a great time to ask or tell. Um, we haven't quite set up the date or the topic for the next webinar, so episode four. So suggestions are very welcome. Uh, we're open to that. In the meantime, um, here is our contact information if you would like to follow up uh, and a, re a reminder that this webinar recording will be posted on YouTube so that you can watch it again or share it with your colleagues or friends. I will send a link out by email in the next few days uh, and I will also be posting the link on Twitter and LinkedIn. Also, we have some interesting videos and talks on the 1928 Diagnostics YouTube channel, so it could be fun to check out what else is in there. I do have a question here. Um, can you explain the scale in the trees in the slide before case one? Let me go back. Um, I'm not sure if this is the one you're talking about, Paul. I think for case, for case one was the Shigella uh, tree. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Oh yeah, so it, it's not the, the one in case one, it was the, the three trees you had prior to this. Yes. The, the not point not not two not point not not four. I've often seen these, but I'm never quite sure what it means. Could you explain it, please? Demetrius, do you have an answer for that one? Uh, I'm not particularly sure because we haven't used this type of trees before. I think, um, I think the. Rooted, rooted and unrooted trees are not uh, UPJ made trees, so it's not a uh, distance matrix based method, but but I may be wrong, so I don't have an answer on that. You can always look into it and get back to you, because um, this is an interesting question. Th these images were taken from next chain, so um, they might have an explanation there too that I can find and get back to get back to you with. You're welcome. Are there any other questions? We are at time, but uh, that's all right. My only slide left was to say thank you for attending. Uh, and I hope to see maybe more of you and your colleagues at the next webinar. Whenever that will be, I will let you know. Um, and if there are no more questions, I will say have a great day and happy holidays.
Thank you, everyone.